Hey everyone, this is Alan over at Cobblers Plus. Today we're going to be working on a pair of fry boots and uh, basically changing it completely on the sole area. So come join us and check it out how we do that. I'm Alan Trushkov. Join us today and enter our world of a cobbler to see the craftsmanship it takes to rebuild and restore footwear and other leather goods, as well as recommendations from our industry. So I mentioned we've got these uh, fry boots here that we're going to be altering completely to basically accommodate the Vibram Sierra sole. The Vibram Sierra sole is a flat sole here, so it's going to be a little bit of a different build. This gentleman wants to have something that's a little more, um, a little bit more of like a wedge style instead of this drop down heel like that there, and so we have to be able to swap it out and build it. So at this point we're going to go ahead and start taking off the old sole of course. This other boot already took everything off but I'll let you check out how we do the process on the make here. So of course we're going to just take off this heel base here and that one pops off because these heels are actually really held in by the nails more than anything. Not so much the um, glue there really isn't any glue it seems like on here if there is it's long gone so now I'll get that out of here now, I don't know if it really has a model on these guys no oh can't really see the model it's all worn out 505079 if anybody knows which one it is basically it's an ankle high boot in other words so we've got the uh, heel off, I'm going to clip these nails that are sticking out right here so we don't end up hurting ourselves in the process of removing the sole. Because I have hurt myself doing it. This is the second time I'm really doing this angle, hopefully everybody likes this angle. If you don't, comment in the section below, do you prefer the down from the top view to see what it looks like where you only see my fat belly sticking out or this way but at this point we'll go ahead and grab our thinner put it over here around the welt area start deactivating all the adhesives around here Here and just kind of wipe off any of the access because this is of course a rubber sole so it doesn't really absorb any of that thinner access will kind of just drip all over if so and then I'm gonna go ahead and grab my blade like that there it's a rip knife designed to go in between the welt and the midsole to start cutting the threads and separating the midsole from the welt itself Some cobblers like to use a X-Acto knife or one like this right here. I don't like them too much personally. I um, feel like you lose a little bit of the control because that blade is significantly more sharper, which is nice, definitely, but because it's so thin, you, um, you have a higher tendency of accidentally cutting through the welt. And the welt is something we we need to try to save. Oh, come on. There we go. 
I'm not a big fan of this midsole, whatever they use. It's, it's like fiberboard or whatever it is. It's, it's like paper. See, it's ripping. So, I'm going to give them a little bit of an upgrade. We're going to put a composite midsole, which is basically a form of rubber. Definitely going to be a huge upgrade for the midsole from this nasty fiberboard stuff. through there we go make sure we got all the stitches now we'll go ahead and grab our trusty little heel pry here get it underneath where the heel area is because that area is not stitched down it's just nailed and glued to the heel ren and you'll see the heel ren in just a second side that's gross that's just that's horrible and this guy was very close to wearing through I mean you can see a little possibly maybe see the little riblets there from the inside right there that's all hollowed out I mean it makes the, the shoe a little bit lighter but durability wise it's uh, it's bad real bad but here's the heel run back here it's that whole plastic piece and I mean that helps keep the shape of everything in the back area and kind of almost a buffer between the heel base and the sole itself um, just because this material is a little bit denser it's a plastic you can run nails through it a little bit better if it was just the rubber sole there those nails would just tear through that rubber with ease so definitely a part of the boot that needs to stay intact at least stay there if it doesn't stay intact then we'll end up having to replace it and usually what we replace it with is a leather heel ren which is nice but traditionally you always want to try to keep the existing old one here all right so now i gotta take out these old nails take out the footbed that this gentleman had in there and then the little heel liner pad that comes out now we go to our trusty little crate piece here, stick that on the back end of the heel area inside, and now I'm going to hammer these nails down, so that they sit inside that crate, I'll take out the crate piece. So now all the nails inside, don't know if you can see it there, but they're sticking up. The heads are sticking up completely. And this way we can get in there with some pliers and take it out. You can see that head there. See, if we pull them out through the opposite side, through the outside over here, that head would just tear through everything there. And you just end up with larger holes. And if you end up having these resold multiple times over the years, then those holes eventually will do so much damage that shortens the overall life expectancy of these boots. And our goal as cobblers is try to get them to last as long as possible. Same rules apply also. Some cobblers do this a lot. When the nails were sticking out, out this way, they just clip them off so that they're flush. But they leave the heads in on the inside. And the problem is, I mean, those nails get in the way, you add more nails and they go so as I was saying, when you get those nails to overlap too much, they end up uh, stretching out the material and making the holes wider. And so necessarily just puncturing new holes or anything, it just makes them wider at that point. So, you know, it, it's not a good thing. I mean, again, a lot of cobblers do it, but I'd much rather take those extra steps to make sure these boots last for as long as possible. You know, it, I mean, with 
proper care and maintenance. The uppers on these can last for a few decades easily. The soles can be replaced time and time again. Um, I mean, depending on how often you wear them, the conditions and everything. Sometimes they could even last a few generations too. I've had uh, I've had boots and shoes in like that that have lasted multiple generations with proper care and maintenance. And get back in here with my trusty heel pry and start taking out some of this cork here. And this cork was a little. A little annoying, I guess you can say, especially because it still has some of that paper stuck to it. I'm gonna call it paper. It's, uh, in other words, almost like a fiber board that's not very dense. Company's always trying to cut corners somehow. And, I mean, Fry aren't a bad boot, but even very high-end companies, I mean, if you get into like the thousand dollar price point on some shoes and boots, even they try to find a way to see if they can cut corners, save save a few bucks here and there. Not necessarily all of them, but uh, there's there's a few out there I've come across. Not gonna name name any off necessarily. There's a few of them actually refer me to. But. That's why when it's finally time to get them resold, if you go to directly to the company, if they have that option for refurbishing, you're gonna get the exact same thing done. Maybe you can change it up a little bit if you want to by request, but it's still within that same kind of category. Now, if you go to a cobbler shop, most of the time we're gonna to tend to go for that upgrade for you. I mean, how you even the midsole on this thing is going to get an upgrade, so... Man. Like I said, I really don't like this one here. Sorry about the squeaking. That's the jack stand that I have on here. It swivels around so I can move everything. I should probably throw a little grease on there. It's been a busy season for us, so... Last time I put some on there, been a little while, so it probably wore out. All right, now at this point, that's uh, the best I can do as far as cleaning it out by hand. Well, I could do a little bit more, but I'm really going to be taking up a lot of time, so I'm going to go ahead and hit it all on the sander, sand out as much as I can, and uh, pull out the old stitches here, which is a must. If you leave the old stitches in there, same rules apply as leaving the old nails in there. You end up stretching out the holes there where the uh, thread goes through and you really end up just wearing out the, um, the weld there. Now the weld does not need to be replaced every single time. I mean, it only needs to be replaced once the weld finally gives out problem with uh, getting it replaced Goodyear welt style which what these are the machine that stitches it on you can't see where the holes are on the inside right here going through and so on the machine you're creating more holes now for us cobblers it does cost a little extra to get your welt replaced because we convert it from a Goodyear welt to a hand welt which uh, really is a nicer feature just because we end up going through by hand and stitching the whole thing on we aim for the original holes we tend we adjust the tension with our hands so we get that feel it's like a sixth sense almost um where a machine if it glitches out you can't catch it in time because it just keeps going or if we have some kind of issue because we're going at a slower pace we stop and adjust as needed but um in general you don't need to replace that welt you know it's designed to be durable for a long period of time once it finally gives out sorry once it finally gives out then um, then we'll replace that welt for you but I'll go ahead and uh, get that all taken care of answer that phone call and uh, <coughs> sorry I'll be back with you in just a minute all right so we're back here again with these did forget to mention a few things also before I did much else. I did double check the shank in here. This one has a uh, fiberglass shank that's got plastic wrapping and multiple layers on here. And it's perfectly intact. Usually those don't 
break all that easily or give out that easily. Shanks usually are metal, uh, fiberboard, fiberglass, wooden, uh, layers of leather as well. So there's a lot of different versions of shanks. This one happens to be a fiberglass one. Um, as you can tell, there are little bits and pieces of cork in certain areas still left. It's better to leave that intact because during the cleaning or sanding process, the problem is that you may end up damaging the, um, the structural base of this here, which is actually this right here. It is paper, pretty much. Same stuff as what the midsole was on it. But the whole shoe is built around that. And there really isn't uh, much that you can do about replacing that unless you reconstruct and build a new shoe or boot. Um, but that's why there's still a little bit of cork left around. It's nothing that's going to stick out or anything much because once we get the new cork in and everything laid in, there's still going to be a fair amount sticking out. And we just carefully sand it over until it's all flush and even and everything. Now, the cork on these was filled in from here to the toe, basically on the inside. But I thought we we're going to take it a step up and fill in this little cavity right here. The intention of cork, of course, is to fill in the void or the cavity here because with a Goodyear welted, you've got a little lip here. And especially in this ball to foot area in the toe area, you would feel that a lot. Back here in the arch area, not so much, but um, we're going to add that anyways. The reason why is because cork is a very nice insulator. It uh, helps breathability as well and wicks away moisture nicely. Also, after a period of time, if you break in that cork properly, well, not necessarily properly, if the cork breaks in around your foot, which it will, it will end up uh, feeling a little more like a custom orthotic. So these shoes or these boots will end up being a little more customized to your foot. So why not up a little bit? Now we have a few versions of cork. Of course, they're pre-cuts that we use, or, um, yeah, pre-cut corks. We've got these ones here that are pre-cut like that that I'm using here today. And then we have rolls like this. Now the rolls that we have, they're a little bit thicker after checking out the thickness and everything. The thinner ones seem to have been the better option to go with. Uh, so we're not wasting so much cork. And uh, we're gonna be using that to fill in this back area here. I'll line this one up just like that there. Save this chunk here for another day. Just gonna let this cure for a little while sand it out get some of that access off of there get it to sit flush and get ready to start doing the midsole on it now the midsole of course oh, I'll grab one the midsole is uh, about an eighth of an inch thick right here like that it's not uh, it's not that weird uh, cardboard stuff that they were using it's actually composite basically a rubber so this is going to go on and then we're going to end up stitching it on nailing it at the back of the heel getting it all secured and that way we're able to start building the base off of it as well as adding the sole but this is very important to have on here because when it comes to resoling the the shoes or the boots afterwards even if that crepe ends up getting damaged the midsole can at least stay intact and you just tear off the crepe, clean off the old glue and start over again without needing to replace that. Uh, you can definitely, to get access to the cork and replace it, you can definitely remove that uh, um, midsole here. It makes it a lot easier to cut all the way around and remove the entire sole with the midsole. It makes it a lot more easier for cobblers to do and uh, manufacturers as well. One other last thing I forgot to point out as well, set this guy aside here. Uh, I did measure out the thickness of the of the sole. I did that before I took off the sole and I forgot to mention that in the beginning. But at the toe and all the way through the ball, the foot area, it measured out at 15 millimeters. At the back of the heel, 27 millimeters. So that will help me determine how much of a wedge and everything is going to be. Uh, taking into consideration the midsole, the sole itself, how much crepe I'll need to add. Um, you know, 
the measurement does include the welt area and the heel run here but uh, that way it's just easier to measure it out i just ended up using one of these calipers here like that uh, digital ones but just if anybody's wondering I've, i know i've had a few questions about that in the past how do i measure and determine any thicknesses well that's how i use a caliper sometimes i get requests to make the sole actually thinner sometimes thicker you've got you've got options on that but this one we're trying to keep uh, thickness as original as possible so we've got the exact measurements we're not going thicker we're not going thinner um, if I can't go one way or another, there are ways of adjusting things, but I don't think I'm going to need to with these ones, considering that the Vibram sole we're using today is not very thick whatsoever compared to the original sole. But I'll go ahead and stick this one in. Uh, it's the it's past hours here. I have to leave these to cure overnight with a cork as is, and uh, be back in here later to continue working on it. So we'll see everybody a little bit later then. All right, so I just uh, got this midsole out of the oven here, and that's kind of going to be our base that we're going to be building the wedge and the sole off of. And of course, we've got the cork filled in everywhere, shank all taken care of, and everything in there. I double checked all the welt, make sure everything's all right. Now, in most cases with these heel runs right here, we actually nail them down um, to make sure that they're secure, but because we're just using a midsole on there, this thing seems to be holding in very well. There must be a few really small staples that we're just not seeing the heads of on the top of this. So it's better not to mess with it quite yet until we have a little bit extra thickness to build off of. Well, not to build off of, to work with. Once we've got that midsole on there and stitched on the way it's supposed to, then we'll end up running some clinch nails in the back here to hold everything together, even if the old sole ends up being removed completely it'll still hang in there nicely but we're just going to tap it all around and then we'll run over here and stick it on the press So for the press, I'm not really going to bother anybody quite yet with it. Once we get to putting on the sole and base on this, that's when we'll go ahead and do that. But I'm going to reposition the camera a little bit because it's hanging off of my 5-in-1 right here. As you can see the handle there. I'll let you see how we did end up doing the welt press all around here. So, Alright, so this is the 5-in-1 that I mentioned we had the camera sitting on basically. But it's got what's called the welt press underneath here. It does a few other things like skiving leather down here we've got a cutter way down here but for us we're going to be using the welt press itself and it's just going to come in underneath here and just kind of press everything out for us that way the bond is a little more secured there we go so now there's no little small gaps anywhere that uh that are maybe open and end up coming unglued even though the stitches will be holding it together we still don't want any kind of issues so i'm going to go ahead and uh, set this one aside go ahead and take care of the other boot real quick because i've got the midsole in the oven here and then i'll see you back in just a few seconds uh, to cut and trim up that mids all right sorry it's been a bit of a long hectic day but i've got the second midsole on so now i've got my hook razor like this right here I'm gonna go ahead and cut off all this access hanging around here. And there's a few ways of being able to cut this off. I've seen some cobblers using scissors, which is kind of uh, a weird thing for me. I don't know why, it just really is. And then there are some cobblers that also use the five in one that I just showed you to cut it off to. But I don't like using the five in one because it leaves a little bit too much. With this razor, I can actually get very close leaving behind maybe about a quarter of a millimeter, sometimes a little bit less even, of the midsole, allowing me to be able to stitch this without having to trim it. Because trimming, it 
it's very minute, but uh, there's always a small amount of the welt that starts to wear away after a period of time. And the thinner the materials, such as midsoles and welt put together only, it's still fairly thin. So we may end up taking off a little more than we'd really want to. And after a period of time, if you do that, like if this gentleman decides he wants to change to a different sole or just, you know, save the original type of sole build, but he wants everything removed and have that cork replaced, after a certain amount of resoles over and over, um, the weld starts shrinking down little by little, and it just uh, eats away at it, and eventually you're left with no other choice but having to replace the weld. Cutting down on having to trim the edges and just cutting cutting it very closely like that will actually be more beneficial in the long-term aspect of, of these boots. Plus, the other thing is, if any of you have heard the term ASMR, which by now I think most of the general public probably has, to a cobbler, at least to me, this is one of those moments where it feels so relaxing. I just don't know why. Especially when you got a fresh blade. This one's not so fresh anymore. I had to use it a handful of times already today. But considering how smooth it still cuts, I still like it. So Now for anybody that also may be wondering, thinking, oh, he's not cutting it straight or even or anything. So when it comes to stitching, the stitches might be wonky. No, it... Uh, it isn't uh, because what actually guides our stitchers is mostly the welt. It's not the sole that guides it, it's the welt. And when we fine tune and adjust everything just right on that machine, we could have almost a full millimeter of the sole sticking out and we'd still be able to stitch it just fine. But why not cut as close as possible? It's a lot better, a lot easier. Uh, for some, it's easier. I know there's a few out there that just will not uh, will not do that kind of risk, but that's that's for them. They feel like it's a risk to them. For for me, for us, it's uh, it's a better way of doing things. It's just one thing that we're more com comfortable with. Each cobbler does his own techniques and methods. Some cobblers they will again go through with scissors, cut it all up, and then they go through on the trimmer because they have to. Uh, some go in on the five and one, cut it off all very close, and they can go straight to the stitcher afterwards. But me, I like the blade, and there's a few handful of cobblers that uh, feel the same way about it. They just use maybe a different type of blade. They use a straight blade, or what's called a hooked blade which is kind of a cobbler tool. It's like that. It's got a little bit of a hook like that there. That's a stopper and it's slightly curved there. It's usually designed to cut out the inside of the heels when you've got a bit of a heel on there if you need to trim it up before having to actually sand it. But a lot of cobblers use it for things like this too. So it's whatever each cobbler is used to, what they're more comfortable with doing. I mean, there's no one particular way to do every job as long as the end outcome outcome of it is properly you know repaired finished refurbished and it looks nice presentable and will hold up for a long period of time that's the goal but during the process each cobbler has small differences the end game the end results should all be about the same again of course there are some cobblers out there and some manufacturers that could be questionable on their work but you know, if you want it done cheap and fast and just fixed up to make it last a little while longer, by all means, those cobblers would be more than happy to take care of it for you. But anyways, for today, sadly, again, because it's the end of the day, I'm done with these ones. So now it's time for me to set them up on a shelf, let them cure and um, dry a little better overnight. And then tomorrow morning, I'm going to go ahead and stitch the welt on here and start uh, working on the crepe base on these. But... Actually, before I stitch them, I'm probably going to sand out the bottom a little bit more to rough it up because there's a few few spots on there that might be a little bit visible, I guess. But those are smooth spots, and I don't like smooth spots. It makes uh, the bonding and the adhesive stick a little less than, than hoped for, and I don't want to end up having to sand it after I already stitched it because you may end up accidentally nicking one of the stitches, and that's just not good. So... I'll just end up seeing all of you tomorrow when it's time to continue on with the boots then. We'll see you a bit later. All right, so I'm back here again. Uh, 
kind of in a different area just because we got a gentleman in here, another fellow cobbler that's helping me out today. So I gave him the better spot. I've got this cruddy last for today. But uh, anyways, I've got them all stitched up. Went ahead and did a purple stitch on the bottom. It's not going to be seen anyways, just because we're putting a crepe material over top to cover any, anything. And the top here is brown. I didn't bother really showing you guys the whole stitching process. It's fairly generic. You may check out my, one of my other videos that are probably a little bit longer than this one, but shows me stitching up the sole. But I definitely had to make sure to show you guys this. We're going to be running some clinch nails like that. And just in the back of the heel area here where it's not stitched, the clinch nails, they're designed to go down in there and then hit the steel last here and turn into basically a hook, preventing this from coming up like that. So, just going to run a few of them in. Got to grab a hammer. He stole my hammer too. All right, I'll be right back with my hammer. <laughs> I got to get some more of these, but they're kind of hard to find just because the old ones are great, the new ones are garbage unfortunately but oof. this last is loud it's actually hollow down here and so makes a lot more noise than our regular one that we use so bear with me So we got the nails all put in the place there so that the heel doesn't pop off on us even though we're going to be running new gripper nails in from the inside but um, that's afterwards so for now we're going to end up going on this uh, crepe right here to get that wedge built up. Once the wedge is built up then we'll go off the measurements that I wrote up from the old sole and start sanding it all out so that it ends up being more of a wedge build instead of just flat like that. So I'll go ahead and get it glued up, stick it together, and let it cure overnight. And we'll see you back in here tomorrow when it's time to get things sanded up. Alright, so as I mentioned, we're just going to be gluing on the base. There's not much else. And then I'll let it cure overnight. So, of course, the nails are all in. And these will definitely help. I mean, even right now, if I try to pull off this back, which is not stitched on in any way, it ain't, it ain't coming off. But as far as the uh, the base structure, it's uh, easier if I do it like this. It, it's just a crepe material, so it's uh, nice and lightweight and gives a little bit of cushion, not nothing too crazy. And there's a few different versions of crepe material out there. There's uh, crepe material, kind of like these uh, Saphir brushes here, which is more of a gum-like material, almost feels gummy in other words they do make soles out of it all the time too it, it's very strong it's very grippy material but i'm not a big fan of it as a cobbler because we can't really work with that stuff too well you know, our machines we have to be able to sand everything out make it nice and flush and it just uh it turns out a big mess on us a lot of times it just like melts some in some cases <laughs> As far as uh, the crepe that we're using, oh, sorry, I had to get behind the camera there and put, the, put that crepe, crepe sole into the oven. The crepe that we use, it comes in sheets. I can find one. Well, can't really find one, but they come in different thicknesses like this here. Uh, this is quarter inch. Uh, we're using, I believe, the half inch version and they're designed to be used for orthopedic builds this is the harder version there's also a softer type which is lighter weight it's called cloud crepe but if you're going to be using these shoes often the the cloud crepe the soft stuff it compresses way too much unfortunately and you know after 
six months to a year of wearing. It doesn't matter if you're 120 pounds or if you're 250 pounds, it makes no difference. You're gonna crush it very quickly. So this denser stuff is definitely gonna hold up a lot better. It's a lot easier to work with, say after you know five or six years, it finally does start to give way and kind of has collapsed a little bit. It's very easy to grind off some of it and then build it back up and make it the proper height or even taking it all off completely and uh, replacing it as well. It's not a big issue, but it comes in different uh, thicknesses, colors, and all sorts of stuff. So definitely, definitely a good way to go. As far as durability wise, it is again, of course, a buildup and it's a great material. Um, and there's a lot of air pockets, so there's actually not too much material there to be able to wear just this say as a sole so you got to have something a little bit more durable like the vibram sole we're going to be putting on so i'm going to go ahead and switch out the other boot on the press get the other one going on it stick it all together cut off the extra that we have hanging off the edges and uh let it sit overnight and we'll be back in tomorrow to sand it and you know get it ready for the actual sole so we'll see you back here tomorrow all right so trying out this angle hopefully you guys like it a little bit may look a little funny but um we're over here on our sander again and i've got the edges at least somewhat sanded up just so that i can mark everything up a little more evenly measured everything out chopped off a portion of the sole up front here to make it easier to sand because after all the measurements and everything i want i want the transition from the sole to, uh, from the front of the sole to the back end of where the heel is to be you know as as uniform as possible and just you know works out perfect so that's why we end up using an entire full sheet a lot of times there are some shoes and boots that we sometimes do where we just need a wedge starting from here and we'll just put a section of material maybe here or maybe the ball of foot but uh, to get the measurements right and to make sure that everything's as, as smooth transitioning as possible sometimes we got to do the whole thing like i did on this one but i measured it out and uh marked it up right there with a silver inked pen so you guys can see usually i use a regular pen and I can see it just fine but on camera I don't know how well that's gonna end up showing up but we're gonna basically remove everything at the ball of the foot area here to the toe and start from back here and then we're gonna have a smooth transition here and then from this area on we're just gonna kind of rough everything up to make sure that it's you know ready to be glued up but let's go ahead and get started on that then All right, so we've got it all sanded out. I double check to make sure to see how it's sitting and everything up here on top of the machine. Looks pretty good. As far as the stitches here, for anyone who's concerned that I sanded through the stitches, no, I did not. These are just the very tops. A lot of that's actually still covered by portions of the crepe. It's kind of a nice extra little reinforcement when you do it that way, actually. Um, it reinforces that crepe so that, well, the crepe reinforces the stitches so that when you take off the sole and remove it to end up replacing it down the road, um, it doesn't take much effort to really need to sand it out afterwards without being concerned about the stitches because they're still at least semi more protected by that uh, original crepe up here around the toe area. But I'm gonna go ahead and uh, start gluing everything up and uh, get things going. We'll see you back here in just a little bit. All right, so I've got the sole out of the oven here. I'm gonna go ahead and stick it on. 
this out of the way a little bit. Make sure it's all fairly centered. for a little bit. Stick it in the oven here. So at this point basically I just gotta press it out and then I gotta go back to my 5-in-1 which the camera is uh, sitting on at the moment and just uh, press everything out make sure I cut off all the extra material and then I'm going to let it cure overnight, and then tomorrow morning I'll be able to come in and uh, you know, finish sanding it out. I, I like to let it cure for a while. I'm also, I almost forgot, still going to run some nails in through the back end of the heel. Now, usually with crepe, we usually don't run nails into the back of the heel, but that tends to work with molded soles or something that's got a full Goodyear welt that goes all the way around the back of the heel. But because this one doesn't have a full Goodyear welt, we're still going to run those gripper nails as a kind of like a precaution because most people, they have a habit of when they take their shoes off, they stick their other foot on the back of the heel and they try to slide it off and everything. Even if you try not doing that yourself, every now and then subconsciously you just kind of, you might, you might be tired, you get home and you just want to tear everything off and get in your pajamas and go to bed type of thing. But, um, you know, we're going to take some extra steps and make sure we run the gripper nails on the inside. And gripper nails are kind of like these guys here. Don't know if they'll catch it. But it's got these little rings around here. And those rings, are, once they go in there, they kind of grab hold of the material very nicely. And so we're going to go ahead and run them in on the inside here. And uh, re-glue the little heel pad that covered the nails and everything. And... We'll let it cure all overnight and then finally we can come in and sand everything out and uh, get these all treated on the uppers, reconditioned, clean off any uh, potential glue that may have gotten somewhere we don't want it on. Luckily, uh, contact cement, we, we can easily remove it just using some crepe material, you know, just a natural crepe brick like this. Uh, if, you don't, uh, if you don't have a natural crepe brick, I mean, Saphir's got their crepe suede brushes. It's actually the same material, but you know, it it's a little bit uh, smaller, more delicate for suede uses. But if you have one of these, really awesome. If you come across anywhere where the factory may have left some glue behind or another cobbler or something, it's not the end of the world. It happens. You know, it's it's glue. It, it stretches, it splatters. I mean, you've seen my glue pot here. It's all over the place. I mean, the tables everywhere. You can't go into any cobbler shop in the world and there is not glue somewhere, ever. The same thing with a shoe manufacturer. There's always glue somewhere. It's just inevitable. And if some gets on the boot or shoe, it's not harmful. It's not damaging or anything. You know, it just needs to be cleaned off. We usually try to make sure we clean everything off, all the details. But if it ever gets missed, doesn't matter if it's by us, by someone else, the factory. Just uh, grab your little crepe brush like this and... Uh, you know, brush it off. Sometimes you can even just take your finger and kind of roll it off. It's, uh, it's a very general thing that can occur anywhere, anytime, and almost every every day somebody's finding a little dab of glue somewhere. <coughs> Sorry. But anyways, I'll go ahead and get that finished out, um, and uh, we'll see everybody back here tomorrow then. All right, so we're back here again. These are taking a little bit longer than I'd really hoped for, but I gotta finish these out today so I can ship them out right away. Today's a closed day, so shouldn't be any interruptions, but you never know. So I've got the soles trimmed up on our cutter. It'll fit in nicely and everything. So I'm over here at our rougher sander. It's the um, 24 grit sanding belts. This sanding belt is a little more worn down, so, um, that way it doesn't leave so much nicks in the sides here but once we're done with this machine we move over to our next one to kind of get a nice and nicer look and for all of those who have been giving me a bunch of you know grief for wearing flip-flops during the summer when it's hot back here hey these machines give off a lot of heat that's why they're 
individual heaters for each, each room that we have here to kind of regulate it because this back room gets the most of it and um, I wear flip-flops but today I've got my Cayman boots on and I had to wear them today and I'll tell you why a little bit later well actually might not tell you on here, but I do have to make an announcement on all of our um, groups. Well, you'll probably know anyways. We started working with Boot Barn down south in the springs. So, I had to wear my nice boots. I don't get to wear them out often, and this was a perfect opportunity to finally wear them. Anyways, before I keep blabbering, I'm going to go ahead and get started now. So we're over here at our other machine now and kind of changed up the angle for you to check everything out on this view of the machine. But uh, we got our rough sanding and everything. At this point, some shops, they end up leaving it at, at this much here of sanding just because you know, they don't want to end up heating up the sole too much or anything. But we usually allow our, our soles to cure for a very good amount of time. I'm talking about uh, 24 plus hours of just curing before we finally sand it so we don't have that kind of issue ever now if we were just say sanding only on this one right here that would have caused enough heat that it would start to deactivate but going from that machine to this one and in between allowing them to cool off for a good period of time there's no issue whatsoever so we've got our hunter grip belt on here i just switched it out to a newer one that's a little bit fresher and then we've got our numb keg here to kind of give it some touch-ups and this thing's starting to look like it's getting close to needing to be replaced here just got a little bit more life just a tiny bit but we'll go ahead and get started then Alright everyone, so I kind of skipped over all the talking and everything by the machines, but uh, anyways, at this point uh, they're all ready basically. We just got to make sure to take care of that brown, and for anyone that's uh, ever wondered, what is it that, uh, how do we get it to look brown on only just one strip? It's very simple, there's a few people that have asked me before, but before I do that real quick, I'm going to grab my little crepe brush here, clean off any spots that may have a little bit of glue or anything let's see okay let's see had a note there today's an off day for me so i'm not quite uh quite working i was running around all over town like i mentioned i had my cowboy boots on we're working with the uh, boot barn down in colorado springs both their locations down there and so if you're in the springs or further down south and you can't make it up to us you can always drop them off at those locations and we pick up there once every two weeks so may uh may definitely come in handy for you but looks like it's all cleaned up all around there but i've got uh my edge dressing on this brush here I just pull it out of the cup it's usually attached to the shine uh shine machine but there's enough ink on here to be able to do the edging nicely but because the particular type of ink that we use, it's not quite a heavy dye. It kind of goes on and uh, penetrates into the leather and 
dyes it slowly, so it's not like an alcohol-based traditional dye. Now, just because it's not the same as alcohol-based dyes does not mean you can re-dye your shoes using that stuff. It will turn out horribly. Then I grab my rag, that's why we've got so many dirty ones laying around like that, because we just go through and wipe it all off while it's still wet. There we go. some off the bottom but it's what it looks like there now we're gonna give this just a few minutes to dry and then we're gonna go ahead and buff it up we're not gonna varnish it per se just because again there's more rubber on here than anything we're just gonna use the nylon brush on one of our machines apply a thin coat of wax and then start buffing it out um, on the horsehair buffers um, that prevents uh, from heating up because when we varnish uh, edging on say a leather sole pair of shoes or boots um, the waxes can be varnished into the leather very easily but it doesn't varnish into the rubber if anything it heats it up and that friction that amount of friction really causes the soles to start coming unglued and we definitely don't want that to happen so we're gonna avoid the varnishing wheels and go straight to the nylon brush apply a little bit of hard wax on there buff it up and then buff it out on the machines so thought I'd uh, explain that I mean not gonna really bother with showing too much just because I've shown that kind of in our other videos a few times where we have the nylon brush the um, the varnish wheels and the horsehair brushes, but gives you the idea anyways at least for me to explain it Now if anyone noticed yes, I upgraded I got these little little ear pod things or air pods or whatever the other day because my phone was blowing up and uh, I was wearing jeans with uh, dress shoes and those jeans are a little too tight on me I got too fat and uh, getting that phone out quickly enough was uh, was a task all in itself but these things are friggin awesome I gotta watch uh, videos on my phone just to kind of relax me since it's my day off technically technically closed day I have been on my phone playing some of well catching up on a lot of missed videos from mr. Jason Darnstar don't know if you guys could see him yeah, he, uh, he just opened up his location, his little shine area in the Scissors and Scotch building. So if you're in the Denver area, definitely go check him out at Scissors and Scotch. Uh, him and I were in the process of trying to work out a few other plans and ideas for the near future, so stay tuned for those, unless this video is already up and, uh, and everything we have going is going up, but I'm sure we're going to have plenty of other stuff for the future. Maybe a month down the road, maybe a year, maybe 10 years down the road. I'm sure we're going to have some awesome builds going on. But anyways, I'm going to give these guys a few minutes to dry and um, you know, start doing the edging. I got a little spot here that I got to try to fix up and then we're going to go ahead and do a full treatment on these uppers with the Saphir Modal Dior Oiled Leather Cream. Uh, I'll show you that towards the end. So I'll just uh, give it a full treatment and conditioning on these guys to restore all the nutrients and some of the pigment. And uh, once we get to that, I'll kind of talk a little more about what it was I used. I'm not going to take up too much of your time. It's quite literally just a full conditioning. There isn't multiple steps too much to this one, other than a few times I did spray these down with, uh, is this the right bottle? With our desalt or vinegar mixture here to deactivate any particular salts that may be in the leather. That I like to do during the repair process. I, I don't really show it on video too much or anything, but I've gone through and sprayed them down a few times and they've, you know, they've dried. I'm going to spray them down just a little bit more maybe on just a rag and wipe it off some more, clean it, and then do the conditioning. So we'll be back in a few and uh, get things going. All right, so I've got the laces out, got them all conditioned up and everything, buffed them just slightly. Like I said, I used the uh, Saphir Adal Dior Oiled Leather Cream. I used the brown and I think they only have one it's yeah medium brown number 37 and the neutral as well the reason why I used two different ones was because I went through with the brown one try and touch up as much of the surface area as I can got inside the tongue area here got it all nicely conditioned try and restore some of that pigment and then right over here where the lighter colors of threading is I don't really want to change the color I mean there isn't enough dye pigment in it to really do much but 
as you condition it over and over, the pigment starts to affect those stitches. And so I went through with neutral on that after the brown, the brown um, kind of soaked into the leather so that it doesn't transfer too much. But thought I'd kind of show that. And I'm gonna go through with a few little nippers here and just kind of clip up a few of the spots anywhere I see thread. Grab my lighter. If you got any threads sticking up ever, just uh, clip it as close as you can and then take a lighter to it because it's nylon, it will melt. As far as if it's coming undone and causing any forms of damage or anything, yeah, at that point I would highly recommend leaving it be. Take it to your local cobbler and have your, uh, have your local cobbler take a look at it and let you know what needs to be done before you try pulling or clipping any of the threads. But if they're just like little stragglers like these guys here, there's no serious damage or anything. It's just the ends of the thread that are coming through. And that's normal. It doesn't matter if you have a high quality shoe, low quality. They all do it at some point. You know, it just, just the way it goes. So we're going to go through and touch it all up. Now, the reason I was saying that I didn't use any other products other than a few basic ones. Got the vinegar desalting that I did first um, before using the oil the cream I just sprayed some onto a rag one last time and kind of rubbed it down to make sure I remove any any stuff that may be on the surface left over and then you know I just used the oiled leather cream these are an oiled leather boot some people know it as CXL from other brands and companies but the way you tell is if you're looking at the boot here if you take the side here and press out you see those little light spots that start to show as you press as if it's like a stress mark so it basically is oiled leather is heavily infused with oils and fats and so they um, so they're pretty much impregnated with it and so when it comes down to the treatment of these when you tell when you press down like that that's just the uh the fats and everything just being squeezed out of the way and everything and you know uh, kind of like if you take like a sponge and if you squeeze out a portion of it and then you stop to look at half the sponge half of it looks a little bit different in color than the other half it, some sponges do it not all but some of them do i've noticed and it's kind of the same concept. Some of those oils are just kind of being moved around, in other words, in different directions. And so a light spot shows through a bit more and all the uh, fiber structure of that oiled leather. But, you know, that's, that's how you identify it. And there's not much uh, product out there for oiled leathers. You either use something that's just a basic conditioner, or if you really want the good stuff, the Saphir Modaldi or oiled cream is the way to go. And uh, the reason why there are products specifically formulated for that is because with oiled leathers like this, you don't want to have waxes because the waxes don't absorb and bind to the leather very well. They just kind of settle over top and then after a few steps or just one or two times of wearing them, they, it, the wax just cracks and just sits there over top and looks horrible. So you definitely, um, definitely don't want to be using anything with waxes in there like the Saphir Pomadeer cream, which is great stuff, but it's not designated for this leather. Other products, uh, Old Kiwis, Miltoniums, all of those other ones out there, you want to make sure that you're either reading what the key ingredients are or it's better if you know what's in them. Saphir, luckily, they're one of those companies that really talk about their key ingredients. I mean, they won't talk about every single ingredient. They have to have their secrets, of course, so no other co uh, company will copy them and make knockoff versions. But their key ingredients for this is definitely going to be your Neat's Foot Oil and Jojoba Oil. Um, there is a, from what I understand, a small amount of a wax extract. It's not actual wax, it's just an extract. So it's much softer and it will absorb into the leather along with the Neat's Foot Oil and Jojoba Oil. So it's not going to sit all over top at all. But um, you know, I thought I'd kind of point that out on it. Uh, let's see this half the boot you know and if you have a pair of CXL boots and they have like say a two-tone or something you don't necessarily need to have two different colors I mean you can just use the neutral because the main thing again the pigment is not very strong in these it's it, it's fairly weak actually um, again pigment needs a harder material to bind to nicely like a wax for example but um, that small amount of pigment just kind of gives it a little bit of extra, 
restoration on color. But if you don't have the option to be able to get, you know, brown and neutral or black and neutral to be able to accommodate what we did here, just go with one color. You know, I'll leave it up to you. Are you going to be fine with the uh, color of the thread getting changed on here on your boots or shoes that you may have? Or do you want the color thread to stay the same color for as long as possible? Then just go all neutral. The main thing is as long as you're conditioning that leather, giving it back its nutrients and everything. There's one stubborn spot that there's not much I can do about it. That scuff right there. That is a problematic thing very often. I mean, I did uh, put a little bit of an epoxy in there, but again, because it's oiled leather, a lot of adhesives, a lot of um, fillers and you know things like that that are designed to kind of fill in a scuff or a crack like this here, they, they have harder components such as waxes in them mainly. And there is not much you can do about it. You know, you can do the best you can, basically. So I did the best I could on it, and there's not much else I can do. If it's a finished leather where it's you know smooth and shiny, those are a lot easier because that leather is not infused with certain oils and fats, so it's a lot easier to really use a filler on there or even use a wax to buff it out more. But oiled leather, not so much. So just wanted to point that out. I did put some effort into it, but very little I could have done anyways so okay but i'll try one more time with a little bit of my medium brown there just my finger try to get it in there okay where'd my rack go horsehair brush. It's not going to do much to it, but it's going to just kind of at least a little bit buff it up. So, we're basically done. I glued in the uh, little heel pads on the inside already to cover up the nails that go inside. Make sure they're all protected and everything. So the heel pads back in there. And then I've got his uh, insoles here. Pull off. I need the lint and uh, dust that we can. And I'm just going to end up putting the laces back in. His laces look like they're still in good shape. Usually we try to replace them if they're damaged. Unfortunately, if they were damaged, I don't really, I don't really have laces quite like these ones that he has. So. Luckily those are still intact, but I'd notify them and say, all right, we'll replace your laces, but we don't have the same ones, so they're gonna be a little bit different. Are you fine with that? Yes, okay, we'll do it. No, then we'll try to try to salvage the ones you have as much as possible. But anyways, um, we're pretty much done. Uh, got that, I'm gonna have to blow off some dust again before I go take a picture of these. But I hope you enjoyed the video on how we uh, convert a fry boot from a standard block style heel it's technically still a one piece sole to more of a wedge style like this you know everyone has a different opinion some people prefer the little heel block on their boots and shoes because the type of work they do or the environment they're in it grasps on better to certain uh, equipment or tractors or whatever they may be using other people it's the other way around they need something that's uh, got less grip like that it won't get caught up in anything and of course it's personal preference too as far as you know style you know if you if you wear these more not for work but more for night out every now and then or just your casual wear or whatever it may be you might just not like that style or or you just may want to try out something different you know? something very different never hurts so you know, you've got options at least especially with the goodyear welted style boot or shoe when it's got that goodyear welt like that your uh, limitations are very very few of what can and can't be put on there you know there's there's just a handful of things that i wouldn't recommend on a goodyear style welt or they just won't work with it basically it's just the way it is but 
but you have a lot of options, a lot more options than other builds of shoes and boots out there. So definitely, definitely a good build that you want to keep your eye out for is the Goodyear Welt. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below. Or you could always stop by if you're local. If you're not local, you could always go to our website as well, cobblersplus.com. Send us a message, give us a call on the number listed there. Or if you want to send in your repairs to us and you're out of state, just go to the ship in order tab or mail in order tab. I think it was ship in order tab. And fill out the or print out the PDF form on there. Fill it out. Place your shoes, boots, or other leather goods in a box. And send them on over and uh, we'll be happy to service them for you and send them back to you once they're all ready. As well, as always, if you like the video, don't forget to give us a thumbs up. We officially hit 1,000 subscribers already, which is exciting. And uh, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell icon to be notified when we release our next video. Don't know what it might be yet. Can't tell you, even if I knew. But I'm sure it's going to be something exciting. I only save the best for the videos. Well, not always. Sometimes it's just something basic. But stay tuned for the next video. I'm trying to post them every Friday night, late at night, uh, just so that by Saturday morning when you get up, everyone's up, maybe hungover, maybe you know having a cup of coffee early morning before a bike ride or a jog, whatever you're doing in, on Saturday mornings, or if you're working like me, try to have those videos ready for you for Saturday morning, get your weekend, uh, weekend going a little better. And hopefully you've been enjoying it as well. But again, as always, we'll see you next time.